today on Missing Link. Where's the connection between paper and a zeppelin? And what does a zeppelin have to do with a shipwreck? What do sunken ships and fruit flies have in common? And what on earth do flies have to do with our genes? There aren't any links? Oh yes there are. You just have to look really hard. Missing Link. Timo Arndt and his team are working on the paper of the future. Paper made of nanocellulose. Der Verbraucher wird es als erstes nicht erkennen, dass es ein besonders anderes Papier ist, aber es wird dabei helfen, Rohstoffe in der Erzeugung einzusparen, Energie einzusparen. Wir glauben, dass es eine Möglichkeit ist, um die Papiererzeugung nachhaltiger aufzustellen. The secret to this new kind of paper is this gel. It consists of microscopic fibers and is called nanocellulose. They can't be seen with the naked eye, as nanocellulose fibers are 200 times smaller than normal paper fibers. A special machine is used to turn normal cellulose fibers into tiny nanofibrils. We work with rotor-stator rotor machine, machines, die auf der einen Seite einen Stator haben und auf and der anderen Seite ein Rotor These two haben, die rotate beide against each other and the suspension of the fibrous material is pumped into the center. Die Mitte eingepumpt und durch diese Through Kammern, the die hier existieren und düsen, wird die Faser to a size so weit zerkleinert, dass am Ende nur noch die, die Nanocellulose überbleibt. This makes it possible for the researchers to influence the mechanical properties of the paper during the production process. And that's just what makes this paper so interesting. Adding just 5% of nanocellulose to the paper pulp changes the surface of the new paper notably. This is because of the nanofibers that ensconce themselves in between the fibrils of the largest cellulose fibers. Die Festigkeit im Papier wird ausgebildet, indem mehrere Fasern wie Spaghetti ineinander greifen like und, äh, und sich fest ineinander verhaken und über äh, verschiedene Bindungen miteinander äh, fest in Verbindung sind. Diese Nanocellulose ist nun in der Lage, größere Strecken zwischen den einzelnen Fasern zu überbrücken und dadurch viel größere Bindungsflächen für die Faserbindung bereitzustellen und dadurch haben wir eine höhere Papierfestigkeit. The researchers run stress tests to examine the properties of the new material. The results will determine how this paper can be used in the future. Ich denke, dass es I think that in, in about a year or two enough raw material that is enough also nanocellulose will be available for use in the paper industry. Und das ist dann I think it will be another one to three years ein before paper made Jahre with some portion of nanocellulose will go into direct Papiere production. Mit einem Anteil an Nanocellulose direkt erzeugt werden. However, before that can happen, a crucial problem must be solved. The results they're getting in the lab must be able to be reproduced on an industrial scale. And it will be some time before that will be possible. Researchers must still perform numerous analyses and tests to find the optimal mixture for making mass-produced paper. If they're successful in producing sufficient nanocellulose, then additives and filler materials like gypsum and chalk that are used in paper production could soon be history. Using nanocellulose would make paper production cheaper and less harmful to the environment. Building an airship in Cape Town. In South Africa, they are hoping to find new reserves of diamonds with the help of a zeppelin. But what has a zeppelin got to do with paper? In 1900, when Count 
Zeppelin had the idea of building an airship, he was not the first. Getting off the ground in a craft lighter than air had been tried by the Montgolfier brothers. They succeeded in a hot air balloon. That was during the reign of Louis XVI of France, who was concerned for the health and safety of the aeronautical pioneers. And so he ordered a test flight, at the helm of which were a chicken, a duck and a sheep. Two months later, people were permitted to approach the skies. On the 21st of November, 1783, the Montgolfiers took to the air. But why was it the Montgolfier brothers who accomplished this stunning technological feat? Well, they combined two strengths. One, they were qualified scientists. At that time, very significant because they knew that hot air rises. And two, they knew how to work with the lightest material of the time, paper because they were paper manufacturers. Put those two together and you can have a hot air balloon with a surface area of 700 square meters. That's 12,000 sheets of writing paper. And Count Zeppelin, he used cotton for the skin of his airship. Perfectly logical, he was the son of a cotton manufacturer. A container ship on course for Cape Town. It's carrying unusual ultralight and super sensitive cargo a Zeppelin. De Beers Diamond Company has chartered it for a two-year research program, one that will ensure the company's future. This shipment is a logistic masterpiece. In order to get around bureaucratic hurdles, the Zeppelin's transported to South Africa by sea. Once the vessel is moored, the countdown begins for the crew. If everything goes according to plan, this 75-meter airship will soon embark on a hunt for one of the most precious treasures found in Africa. Diamonds. South Africa, a gaping hole in the Earth's surface. The Finch Mine, one of the world's largest. Innumerable tunnels delve ever deeper into the Earth. Gigantic shovel excavators carry tons of rocks away in a continued search for precious stones. Rocks created billions of years ago deep in the Earth's mantle. Their extreme pressure and temperature, well over a thousand degrees, transform carbon-bearing materials into diamonds that are carried to the Earth's surface from its red-hot interior by deep origin volcanoes. But only a small portion of these gemstones reaches the surface. Most are stuck hundreds of meters below the solidified magma or kimberlite. While still below the Earth's surface, the granite is broken up in a stone. Every 60 tons of granite contains only 0.2 grams of diamonds, barely one carat. It's run like a high security lab. None of the employees are allowed to touch the diamonds. They use large sieves of different mesh sizes to pre-sort the stones. Specially trained sorters are the first people allowed to touch them. They sort the raw diamonds according to color, size and purity level. Roughly 24 tons of diamonds are mined annually across the globe. Demand, however, is much higher. De Beers is concentrating its efforts on finding new deposits. The company is investing $16 million in this research project. As the Zeppelin travels extremely quietly and slowly, it's an ideal platform for the highly sensitive measuring devices that are used to detect kimberlite rock containing diamonds. Each hand movement must be precise to avoid damaging the merely 0.3 millimeter thick helium-filled shell. At the first attempt, they succeed in mounting the heaviest part, the vertical tail fin, without causing any damage. De Beers has long relied on cutting-edge technology to keep ahead of the competition now and in the years to come. They use satellites to search for cooled volcanoes slumbering within the Earth. The Zeppelin represents the start of a new era in diamond exploration. 
The airship will use the latest technology to detect gravitational anomalies that hint at volcanic rock containing diamonds. Exploration with the Zeppelin is said to be more efficient than previous methods and significantly cheaper. A team of underwater archaeologists and divers makes a breathtaking discovery off the Turkish coast. An ancient ship with an almost completely intact cargo. But what does this shipwreck have to do with the Zeppelin? We humans are land creatures, so we can't breathe underwater. But if we really want to, we can strap diving pads filled with air on our backs. As long as there's air in the tank, the diver won't suffocate. But at greater depths, there's another problem. There, the essential oxygen can become like a poison because the diver is breathing in too much of it. It all has to do with the pressure underwater that squeezes the gases together. The air in our lungs, when full, at the surface of the water, occupies just a quarter of the volume when we're 40 meters below. So, when the diver is underwater and fills his lungs with air, at 40 meters, there's four times the amount of air and four times the amount of oxygen in his lungs. In such concentrations, oxygen becomes toxic. That's why, for deeper dives, they don't just use compressed air, but a special mix of gases that also contains helium. Helium thins out the air being breathed, meaning the diver doesn't overdose on oxygen. But helium has other uses. It's a gas that's lighter than air. It's neither poisonous nor flammable. Which is why today Zeppelins and all airships use helium. In the world of gases, helium is an all-rounder, master of the skies and king of the deep. Marine archaeologists off the Turkish coast. They've made a special discovery 45 meters below the surface. A cargo ship that sank approximately 2,200 years ago, buried under tons of marble. Curious freight. Archaeologist Deborah Carlson wants to find out more about how this ancient heavy cargo ship was constructed. She also hopes the freight itself provides clues about the ship's route and destination. Ivory from Africa, copper from Cyprus, and wine and oil from Italy. 2,000 years ago, the Romans had already globalized trade in the Mediterranean. At the time, seafarers primarily kept a course along the coastline. This was also the most dangerous place to sail during the storm. Yet it's a stroke of luck for these researchers, as shipwrecks in the open sea would be too deep and dangerous to dive to. The search for the remains of the sunken freighter is difficult enough as it is. Many of the artefacts have become immersed in the soft sea floor, and the team must proceed with extreme caution while recovering them. And the biggest question is, what caused the ship to sink in the first place? Deborah Carlson sees a link. It's very often true that some of the most difficult places to work in the Mediterranean are, of course, home to shipwrecks, because the same sea conditions that made them so treacherous for the ancient sailors make them difficult for us. The heavy load was yet another factor. Based on discoveries of other cargo ships similar to this one, scholars speculate that the ship might have looked like this. But the archaeologists still aren't sure where the cargo was being taken to. Each column drum is nearly two meters in diameter and weighs eight tons. Massive dimensions that indicate the column was for a monumental structure. Perhaps the column was intended to finish a temple, a newly built temple. Perhaps the same column was a repair to an existing structure, a Doric building that had been built in the fourth century BC and needed repair due to an earthquake or a fire. Deborah Carlson wants to lift the marble drums as quickly as possible to get to the wreck. Before they can do that, the divers must first retrieve the more fragile artifacts around them. They may provide valuable clues about the ship and its crew. The divers make a momentous find not far from the marble drums. Three amphorae strewn across the bottom of the sea. 
These jugs were common on ancient cargo ships and probably contained provisions for the crew. They must get them to land undamaged or they won't be able to perform analysis to determine what was kept in them. This makes the rescue operation a delicate matter. Fractures in the vessels are not visible to the divers. We have found amphors from Egypt that were manufactured probably in the area around Alexandria, but also from eastern Greece, various cities along the coast of, of Asia Minor, um, places like Rhodes and Knidos, and probably also Erythrae. Um, so, in a sense, that's helpful because it, it tells us something about where the ship may have called a port. But the researchers still don't know exactly where the ship originated. They hope detailed analysis of this amphora's contents will help them answer that question. They search for minute samples of things like pollen and food remnants. The materials they gather are sent to be examined in a special laboratory in the United States. The results should finally shed light on the origins of this antique cargo ship. For some time now, olive farmers in the Mediterranean have had to battle a major pest. Olive fruit flies are destroying their crops. But what does this scourge have to do with an ancient shipwreck? In antiquity, olives were a particularly valuable plant. We can see this in the awards presented at the original Olympic Games. In ancient Greece, the victors, instead of receiving a shiny gold medal, were presented with an olive branch. This whole business was taken so seriously that only virgins and celibate men were allowed to take care of the olive groves. Anyone who chopped down an olive grove paid for it with his life. They were that serious about their olive trees. And the reason is, as far from the spiritual as you can get, money. The olive tree can do just about anything, forming the basis of social well-being. Olive oil acts as an ointment and curative, as lamp oil, was used in cosmetics and had lots of uses around the kitchen. So olives were in great demand around the Mediterranean and there was a buoyant trade in them. Thousands of ships transported tons and tons of them across the sea. So it's little wonder that divers on ancient shipwrecks could come across masses of huge earthenware jars or amphorae used to hold olives. Mediterranean groves, home to a valuable fruit, the olive. But Croatia's olives are in grave danger. Mario Pielis of the Croatian Institute for Plant Protection is chasing the enemy. The olive fruit fly is threatening to destroy the harvest. The extent of the damage is visible to the naked eye. Rotten fruit, full of holes containing fly larvae. The olive fly causes two main problems. It's one is called direct damage, which is which means that the infected fruits are falling down on the ground and they are useless. Another kind of damage is indirect. It means that the uh, fruits which are infested and processed to get oil uh, is giving uh, olive oil as a product, which is which sometimes is not so suitable for human consumption. Mario Bielis is advising organic farmers to use only olives from groves in higher lying areas to make oil. The fruit flies seldom venture to these colder areas. The fruit up here is more or less safe from the scourge. But the insects have reached epidemic proportions in lower lying olive groves. Up to 90% of the fruit in such areas is infested. The farmers have no choice but to use pesticides. But this could contaminate the fruit with chemical residue and make the oil unsellable. Will the olive fruit fly spell the ruin of olive farmers here? Help comes from an unlikely place, the International Atomic Energy Agency, in cooperation with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Believe it or not, these atomic scientists breed all manner of flies in their labs outside Vienna.
They have devised a clever strategy to battle these pests, the sterile insect technique. This involves releasing males that have been sterilized with radiation. Unaware of the difference, female flies mate with the sterilized males and end up laying empty eggs. This reduces the pest population considerably. And one of its uh, biggest advantages is that it only targets uh, the target insect. And therefore it's a very environmental uh, friendly uh, way of, of controlling insect pests. All Mario Pielis has been able to do to control the olive flies in Croatia is set up baited traps, a laborious task. He also performs another laborious yet scientifically valuable task, collecting the infested olives. They contain fresh genetic material that the scientists at the International Atomic Energy Agency need for their cross-breeding experiments. In their labs, they want to breed a super hybrid, a fly that can be successful in the wild, a lively, sexy and sterile male that's more attractive to females than his wild counterparts. If we can ensure that, that um, say, the, the Croatian hybrid with the lab strain works really well in Croatia, Greece, wherever, then that's a good deal. Andrew Jessup and his colleagues are performing their first screening test on the Croatian flies. They set up a tent and release a select number of flies inside it. They closely observe to see which males are the strongest and most importantly, to see which have the most mating success. At the conclusion of these studies, the researchers will have bred the perfect male olive fruit fly. A terminator type male, capable of supplanting its wild cousins. Released en masse in olive groves, this hybrid will ensure its wild brethren can no longer do any more damage. Our appearance is determined by what our ancestors look like. But how powerful are genes? And what do they have to do with the olive fruit fly? The science of genetics is all about heredity. Put another way, determining which characteristics of the parents are transmitted to their offspring and which aren't. To try and sort this all out, geneticists needed one thing above all else, time. It's only from generation to generation that similarities and differences can be identified. And so that the researchers don't have to hang about too much, they look for an organism with a very short generation cycle. And they actually found success in a composting bin. It was those pesky fruit flies. In just nine days, babies turn into proud parents, and that's faster than any other animal. They may not be our friend, but the fruit fly, or more precisely, Drosophila melanogaster, is the favorite creature of every geneticist. Dr. Olof Bugelen made a discovery in the north of Sweden that will change how we view our world. The little town of Överkarlik, Sweden, is known among geneticists the world over. That's because what Olaf Bugren discovered here belied all understanding of human heredity. Famines have had a mysterious impact on later generations. Plenty and privation. People here were exposed to extreme fluctuations. These two extremes are just what interest geneticists. Olaf Bugren found local registries with detailed population, harvest, birth and death records for Overkarlix that span nearly 200 years. He's interested in the effects of recurring famines on the population. In the course of his research, he discovers an astonishing link. The children, and even the grandchildren of a grandparent who lived through famine, tended to live longer. The experiences of grandparents affect the health of their grandchildren. There appears to be a much stronger link between generations than was long assumed. How is that possible? 
had Vugren discovered a completely new type of hereditary. His peers expressed skepticism. It was considered to be impossible that outside influences could be inherited. But renowned geneticist Marcus Pembry had made a similar discovery. Despite great resistance, they attempt to verify their theory. When we got very good evidence, very strong evidence, um, both with uh, our own studies and with uh, the studies with um, in Sweden, we found all the big journals were rejecting it, even without sending it to referees, just, just saying, no, this can't. They wouldn't take the risk. So it's okay for me, uh, probably for Holly as well, because, you know, we've had our careers, we had our reputations. It, it doesn't matter too much that we, we say these things. <laughs> And of course, it's uh, now turning out to be an important discovery. A discovery that is still a subject of intense debate, as it seems to contradict the principles of evolution. In 1859, Charles Darwin published his groundbreaking work on the origin of species. He makes decisive observations on the Galapagos Islands, He's fascinated by the diversity of the fauna. Why are there so many species here that exist nowhere else on Earth? This diversity causes him to ponder the idea that species develop as a result of natural selection. Evolutionary theory clearly states that environmental influences cannot be inherited. Olaf Bugren's observations cast doubt on this dogma for the first time. Of his peers, Marcus Pembry is the only one to support him. Together, they search for an explanation for this mysterious hereditary mechanism. They know finding conclusive arguments is the only way to convince the scientific community. How is this information passed on from grandparents to grandchildren? And that is when her eggs would, you expect, be capturing this uh, information. So. It now made it even more believable that this, what we were seeing, was something that has evolved to capture information and make sure that the eggs and sperm have this information on board, ready to um, change the way the genes work in the next generation. So the baby arrives already partly adapted. He is at the decisive age boys begin producing sperm at around age 10. Egg cells begin forming in girls when they're still in the womb and continue doing so throughout the early years of their lives. It seems that gamete cells can store hereditary information and pass it on to future generations, independently of a person's genetic code. 